we belong to a parish called Sacred Heart. And for me, whether you were in Sacred Heart or whether you were at home, the two sort of went together as I was a boy growing up. When I was 16, I then made a, a very deliberate choice and said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to now move into another small community, which was the Passionist Congregation. I was a bit young, I know, and you wouldn't join at 16 now, but uh, I went straight from school into the Passionist, which uh, probably explains a lot, but uh, I won't go into that now. And, and I found myself there um, in, in, a, in another wonderful small community. I'm preparing um, next Monday the requiem of a very dear friend of mine, a passionist who was, who was with me at the time, Father David, and he his last phone call was to me just a few days ago. He, he rang me up and he says, I'm in hospital, but I'm okay, it's just routine tests. And it was his last phone call because two hours later he died. Uh, so please keep him in your prayers and let's pray that we can have a worthy celebration for him on Monday. But in a sense, it's illustrating the community links, the trust that builds up the friendship. It's all part of being in, in small communities. After ordination, I was very fortunate. Um, I, I was able to extend the small community I was in. I, I, got, I was actually in Rome for a couple of years at the end of the Vatican Council, which shows how old I am. Uh, I was ordained in 1964. And, and at the end of my studies in Rome, that the provincial said, well, you're still too thick. Uh, we, we want you to go and do a bit more study. So they sent me to Paris, which was, uh, I enjoyed Rome, but Paris was even greater. I was living with a group of worker priests there. And uh, that was a tremendous experience. But the, the biggest experience in my small community life was when my previous philosopher teacher, some of you may have heard of, Father Austin Smith, who taught us philosophy. Um, he said to me, I was living in London at the time, I'm asking, can we go, can, can somebody go and live in a poor community or in an inner city community to try and step out of the monastic world in which we were living and, and live alongside other people? Will you come with me? So I said, yes. Um, another classmate of mine said, you're mad. You should not do that. It's, um, this, is, this is going to end in disaster. <laughs> He's still around. I keep reminding him of it. Because 51 years on, that was the best decision I ever made. Um, I'd, I'd, had, I'd had a wonderful education before then, but my real education began when I moved with Austin into a little flat in the middle of the inner city in Liverpool. Those of you who know Liverpool, Toxteth is the community where the oldest black community, they would claim, and I think they're right, the oldest black community in the UK has lived for many years. And that's where we went. Uh, I hadn't got a clue really what I was going into, except I felt that this was what uh, this was the, the way forward. We were not rejecting being passionists. We were not rejecting being priests. We, we were very much sort of we, we wanted to continue on our mission, but we felt we could better do it rather from, from, than from the security of a monastic setting. Beautiful as that is, we were better actually living alongside um, the friends in this new neighborhood. Now, my danger would be that I start telling you stories about uh, all that happened in those 51 years. Well, we haven't got the time. But it, you, you quoted at the beginning, Kevin, a, a, a phrase that um, I apparently have used of setting down the backpacks with all our preconditioned theological implications. What it meant was that we were having to rethink uh, what it is to be a priest, what it is to be a passionist, what it is to be to have faith. Because we didn't hide from the community um, that we that we were two Catholic priests, but neither did we set up a church. We just wanted to come and say, "Can we live with you? Can we can we find ways in which we can learn from you and um, and move forward?" So, in a sense, I know that's all very personal, but it's it's why I feel at home in terms of what you're trying to do in Root and Branch, in terms of saying it's our church. How do we begin to do it? What do we need to lay down? Um, in, in order to find new ways forward. Um, one of Austin's favorite things, which my friends have heard me use on many occasions, was he says, we need to learn to combine two key human roles. He said, if you, combi if you can combine them, things will move forward. And the two roles that he suggested are essential is the role of undertaker and the role of midwife. We need to be undertakers to know when something's coming to an end and, and where how to lay it down respectfully and sensitively and gently, but nonetheless not to try and prolong it beyond where it, where it has, has come to. And the role of midwife, absolutely essential, where is new life being born? 
how do we help that new life into in, in, to, into its new birth and nurture and sustain it? And, and that sort of, I feel, is sums up many of the things that you are doing or wanting to do and are part of in, in Root and Branch. When, when I was preparing for this, this um, presentation yesterday, I was thinking, how, how could I sort of illustrate what is the, what I would call the default um, Catholic position as regards small communities? And, and I, I sort of devised a little test in my mind. And I, I thought, I wonder if I could find two pictures and suggest that one, well, I, let me, let me, I'll just share my screen for a moment. It's it's just a picture of never mind the, the Liverpool waterfront that many of you will recognise. It's it's the river that I wanted to illustrate. That's the River Mersey, um, right near which I've lived the last fifty one years of my life. And it's a beautiful picture. Now the second picture is this one, which I got off the internet. The the beauty of Saint Peter's Basilica in Rome, both recognisable. Now, if we said to most Catholics, which of these two pictures, this one or this one, best symbolizes the, the, the religious, which would you say is, is, is the one that would, would, would summarize for you what, what religion is about? I don't know whether it'd be true, but I think probably many of us would, would probably opt for this one for St. Peter's. Whereas in fact, when you think about it, I wonder whether the river, the movement, the flowing, the, the, the ever-changing sort of uh, colours and shapes and movement, whether that is in fact a better image of what our belonging to church and why we stay in church is about. Because when you start looking at the life of Jesus, I think rather than stability, it was much more movement. I mean, even from his parents going down to Bethlehem, it was it was movement before he was born. He was born on a journey. And then immediately afterwards, there's the journey, the flight into Egypt. And then when you come to his public life, there were all those roads he walked along, all the people he met, all the different things that happened, it was one of constant movement. Admittedly, of course, he went to the temple wasn't always uh, an easy experience at the temple, but nonetheless, the temple or the synagogue was important. He wasn't, he wasn't pretending that that wasn't there, but the emphasis was on this movement. Rather than a fixed church, Jesus was part of setting up a movement, at least that's how I see it. And I think the movement continued and reached an explosive point on the day of Pentecost, because we'd, we'd, it, the, the, the apostles had, had come through the trauma of the, the death of Jesus, that struggled with what's this thing about resurrection? Is he really there? Is he with us? Am I, am I a doubting Thomas that sort of says, well, I'll have to see it. And then what happened at Pentecost was this explosion of the spirit. And the result was they moved out. They went out, they were out. People thought they were drunk, etc. So there's this release of life. And that's in a sense, is what I think we're talking about in terms of this is the church, this is the movement that we that we are trying to inculcate and and uh, and develop, which we're already doing. It's a matter of sort of having the confidence and um, and realizing that that we we can keep moving forward. So I suggest that the DIY root and branch is really about um, the continuing, more authentic expression of what the gospel is about. It's our response to it. And for me, there's a joy in this, because too often we fall into the trap of, of things being stable, things being fixed, things being definite, things being... And of course we need stability, I'm not suggesting that we don't, but, but let's not be afraid of, of the fact of actually moving on. Is it true, I think it's true that I heard that, say, that um, Pope Francis, when he was at some point in, in some of the wonderful things that he said and shared, didn't he say that um, you can hear a knocking at the door of the church and it's not, um, it's not Jesus knocking to come in, but it's Jesus knocking to sort of say, why don't you open, open this door and come out? And I feel that that's really what we're about. It's having the confidence to recognize that that's where we're, and it has deep theological and pastoral implications because it's not one rule fits all. This, this is going to happen and develop in very many different ways. And I think that's perhaps part of where we need to help out one another 
as we, we look to um, support the move forward in, into our small communities. Sometimes when people meet me that don't know me, but they, they realize I'm a priest, and if they're Catholic, it, it happened this last weekend, I've been at a conference with Kevin in the Kairos Center in London, and one of the sisters um, who I hadn't met before, she said to me when she met, oh, oh you're a priest? I said, yes. She says, where's your church? Oh, where's your parish? And they always look at me a little bit odd when I said, well, actually, for the last 51 years, I've not had one. I've just been <laughs> a wandering monk. Um, well, I don't say that, but um, the, the presumption is that you're fixed. And, and I feel that what, what Root and Branch is encouraging us to say, no, we're not. This is a movement and this is the church. This is the church releasing the, the human creativity that uh, we all um, enjoy. So in order to um, talk a little bit more practically, uh, um, let me tell you a little bit about one of the small communities that I belong to, which has been going now for 13 years. And I, I speak with a little bit of trepidation because I know that at least two or three I've spotted who are, who are from that community are in the group now. So if you, if you hear protests or something comes up, so I'm saying he's, he's missing the point, um, that's likely to be from one of them. Um, it, we call our group the vestibule. And the, re the reason we call it the vestibule is because it's borrowed from a poem by R.S. Thomas, which, which he actually called the porch. And there's a beautiful poem that R.S. Thomas wrote where when he was in a little church in Wales and he'd gone to lock the church and, and he sort of, he'd locked the church door and he was on the porch and it was a, it was a midnight night and there was nobody around. And he, he said, I suddenly found myself just there. He says, I wasn't inside the church, but I was looking out at this. I could hear the owls. I could, I could see the stars. I could see, and he was on this, on this edge. And when we were starting up our vestibule, we decided we wanted a name that somehow or other described that. We're part of the church, but we're also looking outwards. The reason our, our group started was because the parish priest where I was living, it was a friend of mine, Father George, and um, I'd been doing a job with the Passionists for about 12 years, and I'd just finished it, and he knew this. And he said, I left you alone when you were being provincial. But he says, now you're free. He says, will you come and do a supply for me next Sunday? I said, well... I says, if you're really stuck, George, I will. But I says, I prefer not to. I says, could we not do something else? What do you mean? He said, he said, why don't you come round and have a chat? So I went round and it was coming up towards Advent. I says, why don't we, why don't we start something in your parish which says, let's just have conversations. Let's see who turns up and let's see where it goes. And George was was a bit skeptical, but he 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 didn't want to. He didn't. He was a bit disappointed, probably, because I was saying I wasn't doing the supply. But he, he thought he'd take a chance, and uh, we started this little group in the church hall. He advertised it in the newsletter, and there's various stories I can tell you about that. But a group of parishioners came along, and they didn't know who I was, and we, we started talking and we started looking at the scriptures, and that from that start, that has continued uh, continuously. Um, until today. Um, for, we just did it in Advent and then we had a break and, and did it again in Lent. And then somebody said, well, why are, we, why are we having the break? Why can't we just keep it going? So it's eventually worked out that once a week we meet and we've had very, very different sort of people come and join us. We've had a, an asylum seeker. We have had um, a member of the Anglican community came who sadly died since. This coming Friday in Liverpool, there's an ang there's a there's a priest being ordained and he's a convert from he was a, he was the Anglican priest of the lady who died and through her he'd come into our group and he's now getting ordained into the Liverpool Archdiocese now whether you count that as a success or not um, you might be sort of saying well that might be a step <laughs> actually it won't be won't be for Derek but but that's an example of where the group has actually it's 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 created a sort of energy and it's created um it's it's given people confidence. There's another member of the group and um, one wonderful Liverpool accent. Um, if she was on here tonight and was speaking at the rate she speaks, probably most of you wouldn't wouldn't be able to follow her. But her confidence since she first joined has just increased exponentially. Whereas at first she'd be nervous about reading, she'd be nervous about leading the group to see her come out. So there's all these various human developments that that I'm, I'm speaking, I'm sure, to people who already know this, but I'm just 
trying to emphasize and trying to underline what can happen in a small group where trust builds up and people can begin talking. Because what we're doing basically is what I think theologically they, they call praxis. It's, it's theology that is developing not just out of a book, but it's theology that's developing out of life because we, we share our lives and then we look at the Sunday readings. So there's a mixture of the scriptures and our own lives and our own theological development is taking place. And that's the, that's the, that's the strength of the small group, which can't take part, can't happen when it's in a large, I'm using the word group, in a large group. The small community has that facility. The large, larger community doesn't have that. It's not either or, I think it's both and. And there's all sorts of issues about how the small community and the larger community continue to link together. I've, I've listed some, some questions that may be relevant in terms of your DIY thinking about if you've, if you've already started a group or if you're thinking about starting one. Some of, the, some of the challenges you meet are internal to the group itself and others are more external. Um, for instance, um, say you haven't started one. Well, the actual startup in itself does present some challenges because it'll probably start, you probably start questioning, some people would, their own self-confidence. Well, well, who am I to do this? Um, who, who would want to actually join with me? Who, who do I approach? Um, should it just be two or three or, or should it be bigger? And then there's, there's other issues then like, well, I'm not a priest, I'm, I'm sort of imagining the person, if, if the person isn't, isn't an ordained priest, what will father think? Or should I tell him? I mean, one of the things we tried to do in our small group was to persuade the parish priest to come in. And, and much as George always, always supported us, he never actually did. We failed in that one. Uh, he's not around now, poor George has died since, but he, he was a good friend. But there are issues in starting it up. Who takes the first step? Um, are we going to refer, re refer it just, is it just going to be inviting to Catholics? Where are we going to root it? Is it basically going to be in a parish context? Or certainly in my life, it's been very much in terms of the community in Toxteth context of where we started. Because I think the question of who we are inviting around the table or who we're encouraging to come in is absolutely key. And again, it's not one's right and one's wrong, but these are issues that we would, would that, that need to be thought about. Practical issues like, well, what time are we going to meet? If you're wanting people who are working, then during the day is not likely to be very helpful. On the other hand, if somebody's retired and, and they're perhaps a little nervous about going out at night, then that would be more difficult for them. That's not even counting the possibility of as we're present, we're, we, we've given our house over to a couple of asylum seekers where we used to meet. So both with COVID and the fact that we'd handed this house over to, to our friends um, in, in, to live there, we haven't actually got somewhere to meet. So we're meeting on Zoom. And of course, as the group has grown a little, one person lives in London. A couple live on the Wirral, as do I at the moment. Um, some, live, some live in Liverpool. So we're spread. So the dilemmas we face in starting small communities is how do you get the balance between that? And there's no easy answer. It's a question of, of deciding the particular focus that you want to go on. I'm, I'm aware that I've been going for a good bit. I'll just a, a couple more things. Okay, Nicholas, it's all right. It's am, I, am I okay on time? Take your time because hopefully we're letting people in now. They've been so patient. Yes, they have. Okay. So, <laughs> Well, the, the membership of the group is, is quite an important one because in a small community, um, meeting week after week, trust builds up. Things are shared that are quite confidential. Sometimes people might cry as well as laugh. And, and that is something that um, is very, very special and, and, and demands um, a trust between the members of the community. That then raises the question, well, how do we handle the fact of new people wanting to come in because if, and i'm not now talking about the people who are joining the zoom now welcome to everybody i'm sorry mm -hmm. that you're coming in halfway through but we're talking about small communities in case you're trying to catch up and i'm just trying to sort of illustrate some of the difficulties that that come within a small community of, of on the one hand 
remaining open and on the other hand protecting the the, the smallness of of the the community and the and the trust that's built up within it um, so there's a sensitivity that is needed for that that is is very very important another question that comes up is what's going to be the focus of the group um Sometimes we, we we go around in circles on this one in the vestibule. What what are we actually about? Are we just are we just supporting one another, or are we about enabling something else to happen? And again, there isn't any easy answer to that. It's a challenge that each small community has to address. There's the the focus as well from the point of view of do we put a focus on prayer? There are two people in our group at the moment who don't belong to any church. Well, well, one of them doesn't belong to any church. The other one belongs to the, to a, another church, and neither of them feel particular. They they're very happy to be with us, but they, I think they might feel a little bit uncomfortable if we were pushing a Catholic sort of context, particularly. So, how do you balance that? How do you balance the ecumenical aspect? I mean, these are the, these are not. I'm not presenting these as problems. They're challenges. Is how how do we face those and share with one another? It's an ongoing process. Come back to the river. I mean, Jesus didn't have much success with his first small community, did he? I mean, he was all over the place. I mean, some of them were arguing they wanted to be the boss, and others were. I mean, one betrayed him. Peter was a mess, um, and, but he made him the, the the head in the end. So, I mean, it's very encouraging to my mind to see Jesus took three years of countless meals wandering around the the roads of Palestine. Um, trying to get his, his group together. Um, and before he actually had that wonderful Last Supper. So I console myself sometimes and say, well, if it took Jesus three years to get the apostles to, to celebrate the first pass, well, it's not bad if we're, we're only on the way. And I think that's an important matter to, to rise. Rather than getting too upset or too sort of like um, self-critical in, in the process that goes forward, you've got to have a broad mind and sort of say this is all partial none of us are ever going to be able to exhaust the wonders of what pentecost stands for and the spirit but we can each at each stage at uh, the, the the meeting that kevin and i were part of this last weekend it we had our ups and downs and and at the end we were sort of saying well overall did we make some progress yes did we take some steps back yeah probably um and and that to my mind is is reassuring it's not easy but it is reassuring that it's part of a larger agenda. Um, one, one of the questions that sometimes comes up is saying, well, if you're emphasizing belonging to small communities, are you not putting at risk the larger unity of the church as a whole? That's, that's a, a common sort of um, concern that people legitimately ask. Um, I, don't, I think that Tom O'Loughlin has spoken to you in, in the past, and Tom O'Loughlin is, is, is a wonderful, wonderful man. I, I mean, again, I'd like to count him as a friend. And Tom, from his great knowledge of, of history and of liturgy, I've heard him talk about how in a cathedral area in the Middle Ages or earlier, archaeologically, you'd find ruins of God knows how many small chapels dotted around within a, say, a square kilometre of the of the cathedral and people say well why have you got all these small chapels um, and you've got the cathedral and tom's tom's analysis of it would be well you've got all little communities each one autonomous in its own way but they've got the larger the larger symbol of the cathedral to come back to so there's there's a there's a there's a movement whereby the small community develops and all sorts of things happen there that can't happen in the larger one but then there's also a need for those smaller communities to recognize that they're part of a larger panorama and they're not separate. St. Paul's efforts with the Corinthians, with the Galatians, with the Ephesians, he was setting up small communities, but he was also trying to make sure that they didn't lose contact with one another and occasionally checking back in Jerusalem with Peter and seeing that if everything was okay. So the whole thing is much more like the River Mersey than the static um, St. Peter's Basilica, there are the pictures I showed you at the beginning. It's, it's, it's a movement. And we've got to have confidence in, in the Holy Spirit and in one another and in ourselves that we can actually do that. There's, there's a wonderful um, phrase that I, I love that Tayyad de Chardin used when he said, um, union differentiates. He puts two words together, which seem a little bit paradoxical. Union differentiates. And I think when you read what he means by that, he's sort of saying that the closer you come together in the larger group, 
Paradoxically, the more you become yourselves in the smaller, either as individuals or as small communities. And I think it's something that um, that is worth holding on to as we as we um, continue to sort of, um, well, as we continue to support and encourage one another. Can I tell you one last little story? Because And then I'll finish, because otherwise I, I can hear myself going on. When, when Austin and I first moved into um, Liverpool late, um, and we didn't know anybody. And um, it, it was a tiny flat on the first floor of a house that's derelict now, sadly. But we decided, good passionists that we were, that we, we, we wanted to start with a mass. So we didn't know any neighbors. So we said, okay, well, we'll invite some of our, our brethren, some of the some of the passionists who lived over in St. Helens. So four or five of them came over and um, came in for this little mass in this tiny room. And, there was only one bedroom and Austin had given that to me and and so Austin's bed had to be in the living room so that Austin's bed had to be serve as a, as a seat and there were four or five of us and we'd all brought but they'd all brought vestments and it was in those days um four or five six men trying to put vestments on in this tiny space around gathered around a little coffee table but it was beautiful there was there was there was a sense of something special until it came to the bidding prayers and at the bidding prayers one of our friends who was very supportive, and he, 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 he said a bidding prayer that went something like this. Um, Dear God, um, we thank you for um, our passionist community sending Austin and Nicholas into this poor area where they will work to bring your love and your, your word to people who don't know you. And we ask you to bless them. Lord, hear us. And I could feel the hair on the back of my head sort of standing up. And I thought, mm, well, that doesn't sort of doesn't fully sort of fit in with what I'm actually thinking. So I did another prayer, sort of that I bent God's other ear, as it were, and I said, well, dear God, I think probably you're already out there in that community. I think it's probably going to be Austin and me that are going to have to learn to recognise you there in a way that um, I hope we're going to be big enough to do. The point I'm making is that the theological baggage that we carry, particularly as priests, is that we've got an answer which we've got to go and give to people. That's not the truth. God is already there. Perhaps we've got roles in helping people to sort of begin to discern that or, or to encourage them in recognizing it. And I think that that's where Root and Branch is such a wonderful example, along with Scottish Laity Network. I know Rab's here tonight, and uh, I think the alliance between the two of you is it's essential we begin to develop and grow groups like this. And one last word, I, I believe that that I don't know how many priests come and join you, but I know that you've got a very young priest called Father Derek Reeve, who sort of is part of your group. And I'm delighted that Derek's um, here, whether he's here or not tonight, I'm not sure. But it makes me feel very young because I think he's 91. Mm. So, I mean, it's not bad if you've got somebody like Derek who's there. And so congratulations to Derek and to all of you for what you're doing. And thanks very much for listening to me tonight. Thank you.